So David finds himself in a bind, you know, you see the wheels turning and said, okay, so what, what, what next? What can I do next? So he sends Uriah back to the battlefield with his own death warrant in his hand. And when he hears back that the deed has been accomplished, David thinks he's sitting pretty. He thinks, you know what? No one has found out. I'm good. I'm settled. I, you know, I can go on being king and, and do what I need to do because this matter is covered up. But the Bible said that everything that is done in secret shall be brought to light. Yes. For what David failed to recognize that the Lord was watching. The Lord saw, even though no one else saw, no one else understood what had happened. The Lord knew. And the Lord was displeased because he had been the one. He was the one who put David in this position of power. That's right. He was the one who appointed him king. For remember, back in, in the fields when David was tending his, his father's sheep, nobody knew who David was. Right. Nobody was coming to knock on his door and saying, hey David, you've got all these great leadership abilities. We want you to put you in training to be the next king. No one was knocking down David's door. Right. But it was the Lord who strategically used the events in his life to bring him to this place. That's right. And so the Lord was displeased because David used the power that the Lord had given him to manipulate people right. and to get his own way. David saw something that he wanted and because he decided that he should have what he wanted, he used people, he manipulated people and did evil in the sight of the Lord, all to satisfy his own desires. And it's at this place where we begin our text this morning, at this place where David, you know, thinking he's justified because he's just tidied up a little matter that he was involved in. Here we see David uh, greeting Nathan the prophet. For Nathan has come with a word for David. But you know, the, see, the thing about it is when David is hearing what Nathan has to say, he's getting enraged within himself. He's getting upset. He's like, who is this man? Mm -hmm. And Nathan is giving great detail about uh, uh, the error that was done, the, the gravity of the situation, and talking about, uh, giving the parable about this, this rich man who had everything he wanted and yet had to go elsewhere to find pleasure. And David was wroth within himself. He said, whoever this man is, he needs to die. Mm -hmm. David didn't even recognize. He thought he was justified in his actions. So much so that when Nathan came to hold up the proverbial mirror to show him himself, he didn't even recognize that it was him. There's a danger in justifying ourselves. Because when we justify ourselves, we don't even realize when the word comes that the word is coming for us. That the one that the preacher or this person is speaking about is us. Because we're comfortable in our situation. We think that everything is okay. You know, we've hidden the situation and so everything must be all right. But Nathan had to spell it out for David, point blank. You know, at this point, parables weren't working and symbolism wasn't working. So Nathan had to come right out and say, David, you are that man. Nathan had to call David out because he was so caught up in a situation that he didn't even realize what he had done. My God. What a turning point in David's life. You see, up in this point, David had been a victorious character, winning battles and, and carrying himself wisely wherever he was sent. This warrior who in his youth did something that the entire armies of Israel weren't able to do. He was able to defeat the Philistine because he had faith in his God, that his God was more than able to do anything that he needed, anything with a stone and a sling and the spirit of the living God, he slain this David who this this uh, this giant who taunted the camps of Israel and had them shaking in their boots. The same man, with his actions, gave room for the enemies he once silenced to blaspheme the living God. Now you think of the shame that must have flooded David's heart when he recognized what he had done. How he had fallen from this elevated state in which he was. A man who was once praised and lauded. Find him now on his face. Yes. For you see, it was the same God that had given him peace from his adversaries. Who had given him the opportunity to, to take things easy. It was the same God who was proclaiming that uh, adversity would be coming to his house. That his own children would rise up and, and come against him. That the sword would never depart from his house. It was the same God that had brought David to this place who was declaring that in his life yeah. would not cease to be trouble and unrest. 
The same God that David leaned on mm -hmm. for strength. The same God that uh, David, whenever David uh, was uh, it, it running from Saul, and he said, you know, Lord, should I go up? And the Lord spoke to him and he obeyed. Right. He was a man that, that knew God. He was a man that had a relationship with God. Right. And yet because he was carried away by the desires of his own lust, right. we see the very God that he served proclaiming evil for his house. Never before have we seen David in such desperation. If you, In your mind's eye, you can almost picture as you, you're reading the description of how his servants went to, went to, to minister to him, went to bring him bread, and David would not be consoled. Right. David would not be counseled. For you've got to imagine, he has had a relationship with God. He walked with God and was obedient and heard, his, heard him speak to him. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's such, it's such evil that he didn't even realize he had done. I don't know if we can imagine, I don't know if sometimes you realize, sometimes when you have such guilt in your own life, when you realize that you've done such evil, you've right. done, you're capable, sometimes we don't even realize that we're capable of doing such things that right. can right. blaspheme the name of the Lord. You know, we, we walk as we say, you know, I'm a child of God and I'm this and that, and then somehow we find ourselves in a situation we don't even realize how we ended up in this situation. And there's grief that grips us, there's guilt that grips us and to the point where we, we feel we can't even lift our heads. Sometimes we feel we can't even pray because the burden of guilt yeah. is so strong mm -hmm. upon us. Mm -hmm. oh. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation oh, where yeah. you feel like you can't even lift up your head. You feel like, you know what, there's no oh, way I can be forgiven. There's no way I can move on from this place because my transgression is too great. great. Never before had we seen David in a place of desperation like this. Even when he was running for his life. Mm -hmm. Never have we seen him so broken and distraught mm. to the place where he could not be comforted. Mm. So much so that his servants feared what David would do mm. if they told him that this child for which they thought he mourned had died. Mm. They were so uh, afraid they didn't even want to mention the fact that the child that he was crying for, they'd weep for, they'd fasted for, had passed on. They didn't even want to mention it because they saw how broken up he was, how distraught, how discouraged, how despondent he was, that they feared what David was capable of if he heard that this child had died. But you see, this is where the story changes. This is where the story takes a turning point. For if you were to look at David's life, one could no doubt say that this was David's breaking point. A breaking point is defined as the point at which a person, an object, or a structure collapses under stress. It's also the point at which a situation or a condition becomes critical or crucial. This is the point that is vital to the resolution of a crisis. The point where the situation can no longer be ignored and a decision must be made. There are many times when we find ourselves at a breaking point. Yes. We find ourselves in, in a place of such distress and such guilt and such anguish that we can't even utter. We, you know, maybe we thought the situation was buried, we thought the situation had passed, but yet the situation has brought us to our knees so much so that we can no longer ignore it. We can't say, try to push the situation away, we can't try to ignore it and say it doesn't really exist. But there comes a point when your situation, as was said before, your situation starts to stink and you can't ignore it anymore. For there's a time when we try to bury things in our lives and hoping that no one else sees the brokenness, no one else sees the hurt, no one else knows what we've done. There are times in our lives when we try to bury our transgressions wow. and bury the things that we've done, hoping that no one will see That's what it. has happened in our lives. Oh, God. But there's a time when your situation starts to stink. Mm. And you see, the thing is, when you're in a situation that stinks, you can't even pay attention to anything else because the situation is so overwhelming, it's so controlling, it's so overbearing that it colors everything else that you do.